I have some terrible news. We may have to eat each other to survive. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Julie, who's the real monster here? And Rish Outfield. He's a cockroach. You think you're killing him, and he pops up someplace else. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Welcome back to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Today we have a story for you. It's it's a classic story. It's not our usual thing. We found this old story. It's from way back when. What what was it? 1937? Is that when it was published? June 1937, according to this magazine. All right. But uh, hey, do you think we ought to give some kind of warning? Sure. Like say, "Hey folks, this story was published in June 1937. Yeah. You have been warned. Yeah, I think that uh, that works. And since you've done that, we're done. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, nothing more is necessary than that. Oh, plus, we're running it on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine. So that consider that your second warning. Yes. You have been double dog warned. Uh, okay. So the story is called... Creeping mm, Death yeah, yeah, yeah. by Metallica, right? How does Creeping Death go? Die by my hand. I creep across the land. Lovely. It's actually called something else, though. It's not, it's not Creeping Death. It's Creeping Danger? It is Creeping Danger, sir. Okay. There we go. And, but double or nothing, who was the author? The author's name was Carl Harry Cloudy, or Carl H. Cloudy, as he likes to be known. Oh, very, very close. Unfortunately, it was Carl H. Claudy. Claudy? I'm, I'm afraid you lose everything, That's, uh, including uh... your life. Oh, dang. I didn't realize that was on the line. I didn't realize I'd pushed that chip into the middle. Ooh. All right. So this Carl H. Claudy guy, uh, 1879 to 1957. Oh, okay. He was an American author. He sold a lot of stories to magazines, pulp type things. But, you know, he did a lot of publishing in the first half of the 20th century. He wrote for DC Comics until 1941. Uh, well, from 39 to 41, so uh, not a long stretch there. But most of his writing is gone, is is forgotten. He is, he's sort of faded into history. The only books of his that are still in print are his books on Freemasonry. Oh. He was really, really active in the, the Mason, the Masonic Service Association, and you can still get his book, Introduction to Freemasonry, the Master's Book, Master Mason. Those are the only books by Carl Claudy that, or Claude. Which, which did we? I believe you went with Claudy and and said that I forfeited my life for saying Claudy. So oh well, see that would make me kind of a, a horse's <laughs> patoot if I started calling him Claudy too. Yeah, yeah, I think it would. I think Big is right. Yes, thank you, announcer man. I am. No, no, announcer man did not say that. No one thinks you are right. <laughs> we'll just call him Cloudy with a chance. Okay. And there is a chance of calling him Cloudy. I, I figured we needed to say that, say something about the author, because there sure as heck isn't going to be an author's note on this one. Yes, yes, I suppose that's true. I hadn't considered that. Thanks for our little about the author. And uh, yeah, here it is. Creeping Danger. Carl H. Cl Cloudy? Yeah, we'll accept that. Enjoy the story, folks. Creeping Danger by Carl H. Claudy. Ted Dolliver relaxed his huge muscles in a well-worn armchair and, with a pile of newspapers on the floor and one spread in the light from the center table lamp, slumped happily. 
Dr. Alan Kane, slender, gray-haired, young-faced, wrote at a littered desk, his keen, thin face absorbed. An observer would have found his labors rather cryptic, consisting largely of algebraic symbols. Finally, he dropped his pencil to turn with a sigh of relief to his companion. Anything interesting, Master Don? he asked. Ted lowered his newspaper and rubbed his battered ear, the hallmark of a wrestler. Just one silly item, he sniffed. It was part of his self-imposed daily routine to read several papers, marking queer and unusual happenings, and so saving the time of his busy companion and housemate. It's an AP dispatch from Moalock, wherever that is. Town troubled by ghosts. The story is about a cow found with her head off. Cows do lose their heads, Alan maintained. Where's the special interest? The bovine tragedy, Ted explained, occurred on a rocky formation in the foothills. This Moalock place must be somewhere in the mountains. Well, anyway, there was only rock under the deceased Bessie, no earth to absorb liquid. Yet there was no blood. There's a rumor around town that the cow was beheaded by a ghost. Alan grinned and shrugged. Then interest abruptly flickered into his face. Moalock. Seems to me I've seen that name somewhere. Recently, too. He dug into a pile of envelopes stuck in a pigeonhole. He pulled one out. Here you are. Moalock, Wyoming. That's where Dr. Hugh Hirsch is. Who is he? My old biology teacher. Swell old chap. Head in the clouds. No notion of anything practical. Just a great German brain that spends all its time in a test tube. He's an irascible old boy. Flies into a rage and threatens battle, murder, sudden death. And wouldn't hurt a fly. He taught me a lot. I'll always be grateful. What's he doing in the town with the funny name? Alan scanned the letter. He talks about a lot of things. Biological laboratory, mountain moss, gargantuan growths, cellular multiplication, physical enlargement for study, cause of cancer. I gather that he's established a research laboratory near the source of supply of some peculiar variety of moss, but he writes almost as abominable a hand as I do. Why doesn't he use a secretary? Ted asked idly. He can't get a white man to stay with him because of his temper. Always has an oriental assistant. Alan began to grin again. Maybe you can get Dr. Hirsch interested in your headless cow. You're kidding me, Ted complained, and untangling himself with dignity from papers, chair, and table, he wandered into the kitchen of the pleasant apartment he shared with the noted scientist, there to poke an inquisitive nose into various covered pots and pans, with which Oki, Japanese servitor, was working culinary magic. You too much crowd in kitchen, Oki objected politely. He adored Ted, but the small kitchen was a close fit for two, particularly when one of the two was a massive young athlete. Ted's finely controlled body had earned him his college course money in the professional ring, but it brought him no welcome in Oki's kitchen. Not when Oki was concocting pudding sauce and trimming a thick steak. Ted stared down at the steak and thought again of the beheaded cow. Funny, what would take off a cow's head and leave no blood? No wonder the town had got to talking. The thing was queer. Even if the shrimp did kid about it, well, better get out of Oki's way. On Ted's return from the kitchen, Alan invited him to the big white-tiled laboratory where the young scientist so often forgot his position as head of the university's physics department and lost himself in some complicated scientific discovery a hundred years in advance of his age. Come and look at my new explosive, Ted, he said. It's just a little thing, but it's interesting. Explosive, to Ted, 
the explorer of dangerous corners of the world, meant gunpowder, rifles, hunting, big game. He followed Alan with alacrity. Unlocking the door, Alan ushered Ted, not into the great room upstairs in which so many adventures had begun, but into the basement. The bare concrete was dotted with blacksmith's anvils and some sledges with unusually long handles. Alan unlocked one of the windows and threw it wide open. "'Good thing to make room for expansion,' he remarked. "'I'm going to stage a lively little show for you.' He took from a pocket a piece of material that looked like grey gun wadding. It was about the size of a ten-cent piece. But when he handed it to Ted to examine, the big athlete was astonished at the curious weight of the tiny object. "'It's as heavy as lead,' he exclaimed. "'Much heavier.' Alan smiled as he laid it on an anvil. From another pocket he took a duplicate, only this was brown. This also he let Ted examine. Then, with some care, Alan pressed the second disc on top of the first one. The two adhered. Now watch, Ted. Not so close, though. Stand over there, ten feet away. Ted moved over with a shrug. Trying to impress me with your show, shrimp? Without answering, Alan swung one of the long-handed sledges overhead and brought it down on the two small disks. There followed an ear-splitting detonation, a cloud of vapor, and an amazed Ted stood staring, first at the shattered haft in Alan's hands, and then at an oddly ragged piece of steel that had once been an anvil. "'My little disk packs a wallop, doesn't it?' grinned Alan. "'It's the most powerful detonator known.' A thousand times as powerful as mercury fulminate. And when it shatters, it shatters. What? What happened to the anvil? Ted did not quite take it in. Where's the sledgehead? There's what's left of the sledgehead over there. Alan pointed out an uneven fragment. Then he jerked a thumb at some gray dust settling on the floor. And that shows what happened. In direct contact, the disc does more than shatter. It disintegrates. Simply blows matter into infinitely fine particles. Quite new. Nice, don't you think? Incredibly dangerous. Ted was aghast. And you carry that stuff in your pockets? Either disc alone is inert. Only when the two together are dropped or stuck are they destructive. But think how this discovery could help, say, in mountain road-making. It's probably worth a lot of money, but I've more than I want. You take it and sell it, Ted. Not me, protested Ted. Thanks just the same. Alan laughed, knowing Ted for the bravest of the brave, but he said no more. On the way home, Ted tried again to interest Alan in the decapitated cow. Perhaps... Perhaps somebody blew off the head with an explosive, he argued. After seeing what two ten-cent pieces can do to an anvil, I'm ready to believe anything. You seem to be, Alan said in a bored tone, and Ted, a little offended, dropped the subject. But Alan woke to eager attention on the following day. The next AP dispatches from Moalock reported something more serious. Than a headless cow. Listen to this, Alan, Ted cried the next night and read aloud from his newspaper. A.P. Moalock James Topman. A Moalock ranchman has been found dead on the slope of Moalock Canyon, seemingly killed in a strangely brutal manner. The body was discovered headless by Milton Hansen. The head, apparently, had been severed by some tremendous force, since it was literally torn from the trunk. Little blood was discovered, and this Sheriff Sorensen indicates that the body and head were separated elsewhere and brought here. No theory advanced accounts for the facts. Foul play is suspected. That's what I call weird journalism, snapped Alan. You'd think even the greenest reporter would connect the decapitated cow and the decapitated man. Ted rose in defense of the unknown. Perhaps the reporter did connect two things and some editor blue-penciled his story. 
The headless cow yarn carried a ghost. And maybe the AP suspected that it had been invented. Alan frowned. The thing needs looking into. The events of the next few days confirmed him in disbelief. Two other men were murdered. At least there seemed no other explanation of the strange deaths in the vicinity of Moalock. The three killings had earmarks in common. The first man had been decapitated, the second ripped in two at the waist, and the third dismembered. All the atrocities being the result of tearing, not cutting, and little or no blood was discovered near the bodies. Tight-lipped, Alan studied the newspaper accounts. Ted eyed him and waited. A blood-red sun sank behind the western rim of Moalock Canyon, bathing its somber gray walls in ruddy fire, bringing momentary life to the wild, lonely defile of awe-inspiring proportions. Near the entrance of the canyon, just beyond the little cattle town of Moalock, the sunset was reflected from the windows of a large, rough log cabin, with a gold-lettered sign over its doorway that seemed oddly out of place. Carney Biological Research, it said. In the main room, a place of microscopes, sterilizers, incubators, ovens, pressure apparatus, chemicals, test tubes, retorts, petri dishes, Bunsen burners, gas hoods, electrical apparatus, all in orderly confusion, a dark-skinned, black-haired young man glanced eagerly from a window. Then, from a high shelf, he removed with the utmost care a heavily stoppered glass bottle dark in color. This he carried stealthily from the room. Returning, he set in its place a similar bottle. Queer, an observer would have thought. But the young man's next move was even queerer. He mounted a bench and pushed the bottle off the shelf on which he had just set it. It went crashing down, and a dark liquid stained the bench and floor. The dark-skinned young man fled from the laboratory. Five minutes later, with a bulge in his pocket that he was careful not to bump, he was saddling a horse in the stable behind the laboratory. Mounting, he rode off toward the town. But he was barely out of sight of the laboratory when he turned off the road and made for the foothills through which Moalock Canyon winds its eerie way. The direct route from the laboratory to the canyon mouth is short, but the way the rider took was long. It was, however, a well-concealed route. Even so, the rider anxiously watched the way ahead of him and frequently looked back over his shoulder. Once in the stern, forbidding gash of the canyon, the rider spurred his horse. He looked down often, however, as if watching the footing or watching for certain signs. His eyes gleamed curiously at the sight of what had once been a tough, spreading canyon shrub, and now lay flattened, crushed, dragged root and all from its growing place. Halfway to that high point at which the canyon meets the plateau atop the Big Horn Mountains, he dismounted. He tethered his horse to a rock, carefully clasped the bulge in his pocket, and started climbing the canyon wall. It seemed impossible for a human foot to find a hold, Yet he climbed easily, as if familiar with the path. All at once, he disappeared in a cave that seemed to run back in eerie endlessness under the rocks. Presently, strange sounds came from the depths, as of a man talking softly in an unknown language, a queer musical note, then murmurs as if a giant stirred slowly in his sleep and moved and rustled. The rider's dark face was triumphant when in half an hour he reappeared, mounted his horse again, and cantered back the way he had come. He spent no time watching for possible observers. The bulge was no longer in his pocket. An hour later, he rode up to the board stable behind the laboratory, fed his horse without unsaddling it, then walked to the doorway beneath the sign. Entering a room evidently devoted to living purposes, he spoke pleasantly. Good evening, Dr. Hirsch. Here's the mail. He handed over a packet of letters. The big man with the look of an aging lion scarcely glanced at the package. It's happened again, he roared. It's happened again, and if I find out who did it, 
I'd kill him as I would a dog. Henry, do you know anything about it? He glared at his assistant with piercing gray eyes in which savage fire smoldered. I put the bottle up on the shelf myself and pushed it well back. Yet now another three months' work is gone. Well, well, why don't you speak? I've been to town for the mail, sir, answered Henry respectfully. I, I know nothing about it. I, I, I gather the bottle has fallen and, and broken again. There must be earth tremors. We must keep the precious bottle of liquid l lower down or... No, it is too dangerous. But these happenings I will not endure. I sterilize and wash up twice now, and all is gone. The labor, the distilling, the slow growing, I will not endure it. He shook his leonine head and roared at the top of his voice. We waste time, 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 and time is life. He paused for breath, then rumbled on. Succeed, we conquer disease. All secrets of cellular growth are made known. Cancer is simplified for control. But now thousands will die because a bottle breaks. Delay, delay, delay. He stamped about the room, bushy white eyebrows frowning, red face working, mouthing terrible threats against an unknown. Master, confide in me, begged Henry. Tell me the secret. Two can work twice as fast as one. If I know, I can help you better, and we can cut the waiting time down by half. Yes, master, by more than half, for I am young and strong, and my hands move fast, fast. His voice held a quality of breathless eagerness, yet the words were so monotonous in tone that their very evenness seemed an accent. Tell you! You would have me tell you! The old scientist's brows worked savagely. You cannot keep a bottle on a shelf, yet you would have me tell you. Ha! He regarded his assistant with menacing eyes. If I believed you would, but no, that cannot be. But I will not tell you. The responsibility is too great. I must bear it alone. Never, never tell until we announce as a laboratory. If Henry's hopes fell, his face did not show it. He said only, Thou art the master, and left the room to prepare a simple meal. Dr. Hurst stood glowering about him, as if planning to take vengeance on something. An unusually large cat, weighing perhaps twenty pounds, came from a corner to rub against his legs. He stroked the animal's back with a hand surprisingly gentle for one in such a temper and then clumped over to a window to stand frowning at a moss that flowered before it, a moss with the size and texture of a clinging vine. Suddenly, he brushed at his forehead. These nuisance horse flies, he snarled. But the insect was not the color of a horsefly. Henry brought a steaming dish to the table in the living room. Just as he set it down, a heavy knock sounded. He went to the door. Dr. Hirsch here? a voice demanded, and two men pushed into the room. They were big men, booted and spurred, wearing bandanas about their necks and wide-brimmed hats, tan and dusty cattlemen. A horse neighed after them. I am Dr. Hirsch, growled the scientist. My name's Housen, the larger of the two visitors spoke truculently. Own a cabin up the canyon. It burned down last night. Know anything about it? How should I know anything about it? You were up there, weren't you? Yesterday afternoon, picking flowers or bugs or something? Built a fire, didn't you, to cook some grub? Dr. Hirsch made a violent effort at control and turned to his man. Henry, what does this fool mean? We were up in the canyon yesterday, certainly, answered Henry. We built a fire, but not within a hundred yards of the cabin. Oh, yeah? Say you built your full fire just a few feet from the cabin, and the place burned down. And you can fork over three hundred dollars for it, or... Or what? 
Dr. Hirsch's voice was silken. Or I'll swear out a warrant and have you jailed for arson. Then the silky softness went out of the scientist's voice, and he roared. He had lit no fire near the cabin. If it had burned, someone else could pay. He had no three hundred dollars, not even three hundred cents. Now get out before I throw you out, he ended savagely. Ignorant brutes! The two visitors shrugged and stood their ground, staring around insolently. At last, the man called Housen turned. Come on, Nike, he said. Let's go swear out the warrant. Been better for you, Dr. Hirsch, if you'd come across. It'll be jail for you now. It will be worse than jail for you, stormed the scientist. You make one move to bring a ridiculous charge against me, and it will be the last move you ever make. Get out before I... He sprang toward the mantelpiece to snatch up a rifle. The two men left hurriedly. Horses neighed. There was a sound of hoofbeats. Night fell, as black as only a canyon night without stars or moon can be. The riders let their horses pick the way. They rode slowly, but even at a walk, spurs jingle and bridles rattle, and the two talked in low tones. There was enough sound to drown a faint, clear whistle, enough to drown a rustle, a fearful, slithering, crawling rustle, a rustle as of something furtive, something terrifying, something that creeps in the dark, smelling of the tombs, of nameless evil. Out from the cracks and crannies, the holes and passages carved by glacier and volcanic eruption long centuries ago crept the blasphemous menace. The horses grew restless. Suddenly deaf to soothing words and defying firm hands, they reared upright. Then one of them screamed. A horse's scream is a terrible thing, but not so terrible as the scream of a man. One screamed now. The man called Housen screamed twice, night-shattering sounds of fear and agony. It was a wordless cry for help. The other rider, Ike, flung himself from the saddle, looped the bridle over his arm, and, gun in hand, faced the unknown danger. Housen! he yelled into the black. Where are you, Housen? What is it? What is it? No answer. Ike's horse reared, neighed, lurched against him. For a few minutes, he had his hands full. Then he called again. Only silence, broken by a queer sound. Shaking but gritty, Ike called and searched for half an hour. At last he mounted and rode out of the canyon, back to the little town. A search party with torches and lanterns was swiftly organized. They set out, and after an hour they found what had once been Housen. He was torn in two, the pieces lying thirty feet apart. There was no blood. The AP story the next day reported that Dr. Hugo Hirsch, noted scientist, had been arrested for murder. Ted handed the newspaper to Allen and hauled from a closet some well-worn traveling bags. When we start, he asked, unstrapping them. Head of the class, Master Don. Alan smiled, though his eyes were troubled. Soon as we can get a plane or a train or a bus to Moalock. Of course, Dr. Hirsch isn't guilty. He makes wild threats, but he couldn't murder a man. It isn't in him. Rapid telephoning revealed that the quickest way of reaching Moalock was by plane. But the next plane didn't leave until the following morning. Ted occupied himself with packing their bags, all but one small one that Alan packed himself. To Ted's inquiry, he answered, Some of my new fulminate. A rocky canyon ought to be a good place to learn what it will really do. It's not dangerous, you know, unless the two elements are brought together. Well, give it to me. It'll go in this grip. But Alan preferred to carry it himself. The journey proved dull to both. Alan did not care to strain his voice talking against the noise. 
But when they left the plane and boarded a main highway bus for Ten Sleep, the town nearest Moalock, conversation was possible. What do you expect to do? Do put that case down. You can't unarrest Dr. Hirsch, can you? We'll have to find the real murderer, answered Alan. He shifted the little case on his lap. It shouldn't be difficult. How come? Because of the murderer's unusual method, man. It narrows the possibilities. Anyone can shoot his victim, but only one man in ten can easily obtain, say, prussic acid. Therefore, other things being equal, a prussic acid murder is easier to solve than a gun murder. In this case, we have victims torn in two. It sounds more like the work of a gorilla than murder. But Grant, it is murder. How many men are strong enough to pull a man's head from his shoulders? You couldn't, could you, Ted? And you're some powerful. Never tried, but I'm sure I couldn't, agreed Ted. The murderer, then, is an enormously powerful man, or the killings are done by an animal. I doubt an animal can kill and not leave any clues. Then why was Dr. Hirsch arrested? Probably some local official making a grandstand play. A stranger is likely to be suspected in an isolated community, Alan pointed out. The two visitors found Moalock a drab little town of perhaps 500 people, with a dusty road for its main street, a few dreary stores, and a bleak little board hotel. A brick post office was its only modern building. Moalock stood forth bare and plain on a wild landscape for what it was, a makeshift settlement of cow and sheep men. Alan and Ted had no difficulty in getting an audience with Sheriff Sorensen, a big Scandinavian, unshaved, roughly clad, evidently honest, determined. We are friends of your prisoner, Alan stated simply. Will you tell us, please, of the evidence against him, and then may we talk with him? Sure. He seems like a nice old man, except for his temper. That's what'll convict him. You see... He threatened to kill House in just half hour before he was killed. Raised a gun to him. We've had two other killings that were the work of the same hand. These other two men killed had had trouble with Hirsch, too. He threatened both of them. It's a dead open and shut case. How about the means? You'll have to convince a court that an accused man can kill in the way the death was accomplished. Huh? I don't just get you, stranger. If you accused a child of killing a man by hitting him on the head with a fifty-pound rock, and a lawyer showed that the child couldn't lift the stone, you couldn't convict him, could you? No, of course not. If you accused a weak girl of shooting a man clear through with a bow and arrow, and it's proved that she hasn't strength enough to bend the bow, you couldn't convict her, could you? I get you, stranger. You mean Dr. Hirsch isn't strong enough to tear a man's head over? That's the idea, Alan agreed dryly. Yeah, but there's an answer to that, Sorensen returned promptly. This Hirsch invents things in his laboratory. We'll likely find out he's invented some powerful explosive like dynamite, only stronger. Looks as if he just tosses a bit of that at a man and it blows him to pieces. And the heat of it dries up the blood. It certainly looks that way. And it's no laughing matter, either. Alan's smile was disarming. I'm sorry, Sheriff. I shouldn't have laughed. But I know something about explosives. Dynamite leaves unmistakable traces of heat. Any burned clothing or seared flesh on your victims? Sheriff Sorensen frowned. I didn't say Hershey used dynamite. Probably his new explosive doesn't act that way. There's a tight case against him, I tell you with plenty of witnesses to swear to the threats he made. It looks serious, Alan admitted, seeing that he was making no headway. Now will you take us to Dr. Hirsch? Hmm. You a lawyer? You can put me down as Dr. Hirsch's counselor, Alan answered gravely. 
Okay, he's got a right to a lawyer, of course. Come on. Dr. Hirsch was confined to an old log cabin, furnished with a cot and a stool. When Sheriff Sorensen unlocked the door, the old scientist let out a roar. Now what is it? You crazy ignoramuses! Can't you leave me in peace? Why, it is Cain. Cain who make the mathematics to dance for him. What brings you here, Cain? Dr. Hirsch gripped the younger man's hand. Ted stood in the background. Sheriff Sorensen waited patiently outside on guard. Saw in the papers you were in a jam. Thought maybe you'd like a little help, explained Alan. Tell us about it. Oh, this is Ted Dolliver, my buddy. He's a good man to have at your back. Like a gorilla he is. Dr. Hurst shook hands with Ted. Yet even he couldn't tear a man in two. It is such a foolishness. And even now, people die, die like flies, and I have it in my grasp to save lives, lives, lives. What have I to do with these killings? Nothing, nothing. Yet mein work, it must wait, and sick men die while I wait. He paced back and forth, his blue eyes looking far away as he saw visions of the battlefield of disease, himself a general leading a victorious army against the enemies of mankind. Alan brought him gently back to the present. Suppose you tell me what you're trying to do here, Dr. Hirsch, he suggested. I think I can follow you, although biology isn't my speciality. Ha! I do marvels, Kane, marvels! I have... By the tale, the idea of ideas. I'm on the track of the cure of cancer. And if it work, and it shall work, millions of lives I save. Yet these fools arrest me for murder. They stop my work. They... Alan interrupted. Don't worry. We'll soon get at the bottom of things. Ted, drift out around town, will you? Find out what they're saying. Ted saw that Alan wanted to talk alone with Dr. Hirsch and strode away to roam in and out of stores, exchanging nods of greeting and watching for a chance to win himself a welcome in some group of excitedly talking cattlemen. But for a while, he was afraid he was going to learn nothing. Whenever he joined a group, the talk died down and men began to drift away. Finally, he walked into a grocery store where a cartwheel of rich-looking yellow cheese, freshly cut, caught his eye and suggested a possible solution to his social problem. Paying no attention to the group of men leaning on the counter, perched on barrels and tilted in rickety chairs, he strode over to the cheese, beamed on the proprietor, and ejaculated, That's what I call cheese. Cut me off a couple good-sized slices, will you? Got some good fresh crackers? Those look fine. I'm hungry. Huge and boyish, his hands and mouth full, he turned to face the watching crowd and, as if suddenly aware of their notice, assumed an air of small boy embarrassment so convincing that they all grinned. Hastily swallowing his mouth full, he grinned back. Say, he blurted, come in on this, will you? I'll stand treat. I like company when I eat. He nodded to the storekeeper, who began slicing more cheese, and in a few minutes the whole group was chatting away over wedges of tangy yellow cheese tucked between crisp crackers, and the huge young stranger in their midst could sit accepted on the edge of the counter and soak up rumors and surmises as tongues were loosened in the mellowing atmosphere of an impromptu hearty lunch. Ted spent an hour as a sponge to gossip before he returned to the hotel, where Alan waited, impatient to know what he had heard. The trouble began six months ago, Ted stated. Chickens were found with their heads torn off, then dogs and cats. After that came an epidemic of decapitated sheep. Next came the cows. Remember the headlines of a Bessie in the AP dispatch? It's the absence of blood that started the ghost theory. Whether the animals died on the plains or up in the rocky canyon, blood didn't soak into the ground or discolor the rocks. So, some of the men think the ghost drinks it. There's always fact behind a fable, 
Alan remarked as Ted paused. Rot, answered Ted crossly. Then men were pulled to pieces. Three of them had been threatened by Dr. Hirsch. Two had promised to report Dr. Hirsch to the state police for killing their cattle. The third to arrest him for arson. Alan jumped up, looking at his watch. Come on, Ted. I want to go to the canyon. It all fits. Now if I can find just one thing. Accustomed to Alan's acting first and explaining afterwards, Ted asked no questions. It was only a mile from town to the laboratory and another to the entrance of Moalock Canyon. The scenery was wildly, terribly beautiful. Ted tramped along through the canyon, peopling the rocky split in the mountains with giants and dragons. Rising high and roughly sheer on either side, the rock walls in the drab afternoon sunlight shone with a drab chromatic scale that spoke of ancient fires, the erosion of years, the slow and pitiless march of time. Alan's gaze was not upon lofty heights, but upon the rocks over which they walked, up a faint road scarcely discernible. He stopped often to look at small stones, the leaves of a few hardy shrubs, the occasional sagebrush which grows where nothing else will root, its gray-green blending with the rocky floor of the canyon. "'See there!' Alan pointed. Ted saw nothing. "'See what?' "'The rocks,' answered Alan. The points, the the points, man. Ted shook his head. A thousand small pieces of rock, seemingly just like millions they had passed, lay beneath his gaze. He stared down at them. The points? Mastodon, you're blind, answered Alan. Look at that clump of sagebrush. Seems like all the rest. What about it? Why should half of a clump of sagebrush lean to the right? and the other half to the left, prodded Alan. Give it up. Why? Alan didn't answer. Once he stopped to examine a huge boulder narrowly. All Ted could see that could possibly be considered unusual was a faint gray deposit upon its side. He touched it with a tentative thumb. Nothing but alkali, he declared. Some parts of the West are full of this stuff. I hope not was all Alan said, his mouth oddly grim. I hope not. It grew even grimmer when, in a few minutes, he stopped to examine a fist-sized pinkish-yellow patch of something that clung to a rough, sharp point jutting out on another boulder. Carefully, he detached it, studied it, then held it out to his companion. Ted didn't take it. He eyed it with distaste. What was it? Might be a piece of skin. Fairly fresh skin, just turning a little brown on the edges. Thick and still greasy, or something there toward the center. He touched it gingerly. Slimy, he snorted and frowned, a little astonished at his feeling of revulsion. In all his handling of big game, he had never had this feeling. Disgusting bit of hide. Not human, that's for sure. No. Alan agreed, almost rigidly. Inhuman, I'd say. He said nothing more. Though his face, too, reflected revulsion, he hunted an old envelope out of an inside pocket, put the pinkish-yellow patch in it, and dropped it into his outside coat pocket. That done, he fell to studying the canyon floor there beside the big jagged boulder. Yes, he said, half to himself. The stones tell the story. Look at all those points again. Ted looked and shrugged impatiently. What points, shrimp? But Alan was stooping swiftly to pick up a stone unlike the others around it. No, it wasn't a stone. Ted realized, gazing down at the new object in Alan's hand. It's horn, the big wrestler ventured. Tip of a cow's horn, maybe? Only it's as big as I'll get out. But it's the tip of something's horn, all right, or that's my guess. Only a feeler, Mastodon. Alan's faint grin was exasperating to a baffled man. All right, all right, Ted growled. I'm not supposed to have brains. All I can do is guess and put out feelers. Now, what are you staring at? How far would you say it is from that jagged boulder to the other big rock there? How wide is the space between them? Six feet, maybe, Ted said shortly. Maybe a little less? 
Alan nodded reflexively, too absorbed in his thoughts to notice Ted's tone. At last he started on, and Ted resignedly followed. For two hours they wandered, Alan's eyes roving, searching, his tongue still. The sun disappeared behind the canyon rim. Dusk shrouded the rocky walls. Let's go back, suggested Alan at last. With a sigh of relief, Ted turned. Well, what do you know now? he demanded. It's serious. Horribly serious, Ted. But we have something to do before I talk. We'll go to the laboratory. And we'll go now. It isn't very safe. Here. Wish I had a gun. You might as well wish for a pea shooter, snapped Alan. Let me think. The darkness descended almost with a thud. Ted produced a flashlight, winning from Alan a sudden, always the perfect companion. Half an hour more brought them out of the canyon into view of the lighted windows of the low laboratory building. They headed for it. Ted was for knocking, but Alan laid a finger to his lips. Obediently, Ted crept to the window, which was curtained. Around the edges, light streamed. Little was to be seen, but occasionally they caught sight of the legs of a man walking rapidly. Satisfied, Alan knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again. Then Ted thundered upon the door with a ham-like fist. Still no answer. Can you break it? Alan's voice was eager. Ted put his shoulder to the door. <clears throat> it gave a fraction of an inch. Retiring ten feet, Ted launched himself at it. Two hundred and fifteen pounds of solid flesh propelled by muscles like Ted's make a terrific battering ram. <clears throat> the door cracked, <clears throat> then gave. <clears throat> the lock splintered. Ted stumbled into the room. Alan, following, cried sharply, Look out, Ted! Facing them, Henry stood at bay, a rifle in his hands. Put that down, commanded Alan. We are friends of Dr. Hirsch. Do friends break into a man's house? inquired Henry. His dark face was alight with fear, yet it held something so like triumph that Alan was puzzled. His glance went to a desk that had been broken open, to papers scattered about, to notebooks on the floor. Henry explained hurriedly. I search for a paper for Dr. Hirsch. Knowing Henry's type of man, Ted at this point stepped forward, casually knocked up the rifle, took it away from the slender assistant, and set it down in a corner. Oh, you search for a paper. Alan's voice was contemptuous. Well, give it to me. I'll take it to Dr. Hirsch. The dark eastern eyes flashed. Then they lost their flame, and Henry cringed. I... I beg your pardon. I I have not yet found the paper. Do you permit me to rearrange what I have disarranged while hunting? He gestured to the littered floor. No. Ellen's voice was sharp. I know what the paper is. I'll find it. You may go. Without a word, Henry left the room. The big cat came from a corner and rubbed against Ted's legs, purring loudly. Alan slapped at a fly, annoyingly large. Ted looked his inquiry. It's a bad business, Ted, answered Alan. Very bad. Dr. Hirsch has played with something he doesn't understand, and it got away from him. Played with what? That thing which has just left the room, answered Alan. You mean Henry is the murderer? Ted was incredulous. He hasn't the strength of a woman. Alan looked at his companion oddly. At last, he asked, Know anything about cancer, Ted? Not much. Deadly, often incurable, cause not known. Why? What has cancer to do with this? Dr. Hirsch is searching for the cause of growth. Do you know why a man doesn't grow to be ten or twenty feet tall? Why an elephant is big and a cat small? Not that the animal rubbing against you is small. My word, what a cat! Ted stroked it absently. I don't know. Do you? Alan chose his words for Ted's layman mind. No one knows anywhere near all the story of the endocrine glands, but we do know that the pituitary gland is one of the most important of them, 
and there's little doubt that it secretes hormones, activity-rousing substances, that constitute a controlling factor in growth. Ted swallowed a yawn. Undisturbed, Alan continued, We have clear evidence that overgrowth of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland produces in man the disease known as acromegaly. People who have it suffer from enlargement of the bones of the face and the hands and feet. In early life, overgrowth of the lobe produces gigantism, and we have men seven feet tall or even more. That makes it tough for the tailors, said Ted. What comes next? Skip everything you can. Certain amino acids not produced in the body are essential for growth. Tryptophan, histidine, cysteine, lysine, found in milk, eggs, wheat, rye, and so on. You're boring me, shrimp. I shan't be in a moment, answered Alan quietly. There is also evidence of a hormone that produces precociousness, early maturity, and unusual virility, fierceness. Well? Dr. Hirsch has a new idea by the wrong end. He has discovered a series of electrically stimulated reactions that step up the power of the anterior lobe so that the growth it produces runs wild. When he can control it, he expects to grow cancers at will, at tremendous speed and size. If he can thus determine the cause of cancer, he believes he can find its cure. What has all that to do with these murders? Ted, how much stronger than you would a man have to be to drag a victim's head from his shoulders? I'll bite. How much? Twice? Thrice? A man's head is not pulled from his shoulders when he drops six feet with a rope around his neck, Alan pointed out. Hmm, Ted pondered. A man twelve feet tall would be four times the weight of a six-foot man, and presumably four times as strong. You think Dr. Hirsch's growth process has produced some giant men who specialize in dragging heads from bodies? Even cow's heads? (laughs) Sounds silly to me. Your mathematics are wrong, answered Alan. A man twelve feet tall, twice the normal height, would also be twice as broad and twice as thick. He would weigh eight times as much as before. But why stop at twelve feet? Ted made mental calculations, frowning. Of course, twice the height means twice the width and twice the thickness too. A man twenty-four feet tall would weigh 64 times as much as a six-foot man. If the man originally weighed 150 pounds, as a giant he'd weigh nearly 10,000 pounds. And collapse of his own weight. Strength of materials increases as the square, weight as the cube. Now, let's go on. A man is supported on two legs. A beast has four. Ted? Alan's voice dropped to a whisper. What organism, grown to many times its normal size, would not collapse of its weight? Ted drew a startled breath and turned sharply to stare at Alan. (gasps) Outside, a faint wind sighed through a few scraggly cottonwoods. Inside, the great cat purred softly. The windows were black squares in a lamp-lit room that had suddenly filled with horror, as if something inhuman had entered it. After a long minute... Ted brought out. Well? Alan answered slowly. Look at the cat. Have you noticed the big flies in this room? That moss has leaves the size of ivy, yet it is true moss. Dr. Hirsch found the principle that controls growth, but not a way to control it. Some of the growth-producing substance has escaped, and some has been fed to a... The door opened, and Henry came in softly almost cringing. "'I beg your pardon,' he said humbly. "'The walls are thin. I could not help hearing. You are right. Some of Dr. Hirsch's super pituitary extract has escaped. I I, I, I can show you the result if you will come with me, if if you were not afraid.' "'What do you mean?' asked Alan. "'Well, I can take you to the murderer,' answered the slim, soft-voiced man, his dark eastern eyes shining. The, the giant who has done these things, the... 
There, he stopped. Go on. The what? Bear? Elephant? What? My masters would not believe me if I told, but you will believe what you see. He, but it, lives in a cave up the canyon. I, 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 I can take you there. If you are not afraid. We are not afraid, Alan answered. But Ted was not so sure. In the slim man's dark eyes, he had caught a flash of hatred, as instantaneous as lightning, gone in a moment. Let's get started, Alan urged quietly. Well, it, it is not yet time, not, not the time, answered Henry. Go to the hotel, if you will, and, and eat. Return here at ten o'clock. I will have ready all that we need. Torches, a rope, horses. And I'll bring my gun, Ted put in sourly. He did not like this slim, dark-faced man. Of a surety, but my master has guns. See? Henry opened a desk drawer in which there were two forty-fives and ammunition. Those are better than mine. Ordinarily, Ted would have preferred his thirty-eight automatic, but if they were to face a murderer, a forty-five was better. During a long two hours, Ted got no information from Alan. I'm sure of what we'll find, yet I can't prove it. My reputation as a prophet might suffer if I'm wrong. We'll know shortly, was all that Alan would say. That he believed they were going into danger, Ted understood when the scientist strapped to his belt the little leather case he had guarded carefully during their journey from the University City. But when Ted asked what he expected to do with it, Alan made no answer. At ten o'clock they found Henry ready with three horses. Slung from each saddle was a large, bale-handled flashlight. At the door of the laboratory, he held out a gun to each as they came within the lamplight of the door. "'Where's yours?' Ted asked shortly, after making sure the one Henry had given him was loaded. "'I, I do not know how to shoot,' Henry jerked. Y "'You must protect me if there is danger.' "'There is always danger.' "'Isn't there, from a murderer?' asked Alan quietly. The dark eyes flashed again, that sudden look of hatred. But Henry made no answer, nor did he object to Ted's writing slightly behind him. "'Please do not light the lanterns until I say,' he suggested as he guided them north into the canyon. They traveled for an hour. Ted was certain they'd come farther than he and Alan had in the walk of that afternoon." He pondered as they rode, trying to puzzle out what Alan had learned from those points of rocks and that leaning sagebrush and that repulsive patch of skin and the curious horn-like tip. He himself had learned nothing from them, but the shrimp's brain had an uncanny way of clicking. At last, Henry called a halt. "'We'll leave the horses here,' he said. "'It is a difficult climb. For safety we rope, like the Swiss mountaineers.' I lead. This suited Ted's lack of trust in the dark-skinned man, with Henry ahead unarmed and himself bringing up the rear, a gun at his side. No danger could be great, Ted thought. He had no faith in the theory of a giant big enough to tear men in two. Working by their flashlight beams, they roped to themselves as mountaineers. Soon they were on their way up. The ascent was not so difficult as it had sounded, Ted was aware of the effort required, but his bright, small circle of light made clear the footing, while the darkness concealed the height and steepness of the rocky walls. Half an hour later, their guide halted. He twisted to turn toward them. And in the flicker of his flash, his dark eyes gleamed. The cave, he whispered. He, it, is within. Far within. You are not afraid. Ted had not bargained for a cave. In spite of his scoffing, the eeriness of the night, the strange surroundings, the gleaming eyes of the dark-skinned man, all had their effect. To face a murderer in the open, gun in hand, was one thing. To enter a cave and confront the deadly unknown was another. What horrible crushing force would they find? A giant man? A huge bear? Alan's words came back to him. What organism, grown to many times its normal size, would not collapse of its own weight? But hanging back was no good. Come on. I mean, go on. 
Ted growled. Alan, get behind me. The scene brightened. The entrance to the cave was not more than seven feet high and as many feet broad. Then they were making their way along a tortuous rocky tunnel, walled with sharp-edged boulders, unweathered. The gray rocks reflected the beams from the three flashlights until the tunnel was almost as well illuminated as a room. The floor was rough and uneven. Ted noted a slight gray deposit here and there, such as Alan had seen in the afternoon on the boulder. The passage twisted and turned into the mountainside, perhaps a hundred yards, then gradually widened into a room a hundred feet long, almost as wide, and perhaps forty feet high. Their guide led them toward the far end. When they were halfway, Ted could see the mouth of another passageway looming up blackly. Where does that go? he asked sharply. The slim, gliding guide did not answer. At the back of the great room, he untied himself from the rope. Turn your flash beam back, he suggested, and Ted saw his eyes gleam again. Was it hatred or triumph? I will call the murderer. With that, he ran lightly back to the mouth of the black tunnel Ted had asked about. Ted and Alan freed themselves from the rope. Neither wanted to face an unknown danger in hampering coils. Ted held his gun. Alan fumbled with his little leather case, his eyes on that slim figure at the tunnel mouth. Ted watched the Easterner with rising excitement, his great muscles tightening. The cave was forbidding. Gradually he became conscious of an evil odor. The man called Henry opened his shirt, pulled at a cord about his neck, and drew forth a slender object that he put to his lips. From it came a soft, clear, musical note. <whistles> Ted thought inconsequentially of a fragmentary line, the weird and wistful wailing of the melancholy flute. Their flashlight beams illuminated the tunnel mouth and the waiting player of the pipe. His beam was projected into the recess. He glanced at them and gazed again into the black opening. Pipe to his lips. Once more he blew the note. <whistles> Ted's spine tingled. Alan gasped. What was the horror so slow in emerging? What nightmarish monster would appear in that black opening? Again the flute, and then a wild yell of triumph from the dark easterner. Behold, behold the murderer, he cried. Behold that which will murder you, as it has others who have stood between me and Hirsch's secret. Behold, behold, and tremble, white men, for you have few minutes left. Two huge eyes, a foot and a half in diameter, gleamed four feet apart above a slavering, slobbering, horny mouth. Horn-like whiskers protruded from either side. An enormous head of scaly, puffy, pinkish-yellow skin reared ten feet in the air as the gigantic monster came sliding, stinkingly, oilily, gruesomely, out of the black tunnel into the great room. Ted stared in frozen horror. Vile, enormous, creeping. Was it a snake or worm? At the sound of the flute, the monster stopped. as if by command. Full twenty feet waved slowly, drunkenly in the air. The great eyes gleamed, fathomless pits of jet lit with a reddish hue as the flash beam struck the retina. Drops from the foul mouth splashed upon the stones. With an inarticulate cry, Ted dropped on one knee to aim at a giant eye. But Alan caught his arm. Wait, he urged. You see, he minds me. What I tell him, he does, boasted the slight dark man from the far-off regions that mother magic, or what passes as magic. His words rushed on in a strange sing-song of triumph, a cry of warped and thwarted ambition. He minds me, he, the monster murderer, minds me. From a boy I train him, train him when he is but a foot long. He is the giant worm of my country. Oh, my country, but never so big there. Now he is great, and I am great, I who control him. He stands between me and all enemies. Who injures Dr. Hirsch, who would discover his secret? These he kills. Ted's brain raced. Couldn't they dash for the entrance, escape? 
Such scythes should be sluggish. Yet there had been many deaths. The impossible monster must be incredibly quick. You would like to know more? cried the Easterner. I tell you, it is good to tell. I hate you. I hate you all. I steal Dr. Hirsch's extract. Twice I steal it. I feed it to my worm. He grows. How he grows! He feeds. How he feeds! First the chickens, then the sheep, the cows, and last he feeds on human blood. The men who threaten my master, they die. Some day I shall find my master's secret, then he will die, die as you will die. Die by the suckers on my worm's body, which tear and rend. You have not observed them? Come forward, O worm, and show thyself. Show these thy victims with what thou dost rend. Show them. Stop, roared Ted. I shoot at the count of three. One, two. The slight, dark-faced man swayed with laughter. Shoot then, big man, but not with the gun I gave you. (laughs) There is no powder in the cartridge. Ted pulled the trigger. Only a click. He pulled again. A click. Nothing more. The man called Henry once more blew his pipe. And at the command, the gigantic worm lowered his awful head and slid slimily forward. The great mouth was turned toward them. The eyes glared at them. See? See? cried the Easterner. They suckers. They clamp. They rend. They tear. Soon they will clamp and rend and tear your flesh, and my pet shall feed and grow strong again. The round, pipe-like projections studying the monster worm's body, muscular rings like those on the arms of an octopus, made Ted's flesh creep. The worm crawled slowly toward them, its fetid mouth open, its huge eyes menacing, predatory. Henry danced and capered beside it, tiny against the monster's huge proportions. Ted estimated it as fifty feet long, six or seven feet in diameter. Even in that tense moment, Ted noted how the slow crawl disturbed loose stones, pointing all the narrower ends one way, and he saw the half-raw, half-healed spot on one pinkish-yellow side, even saw the broken end of one horn-like whisker. But Ted shook himself. This was a time to act. Act. With all his strength, he threw his useless gun straight at the advancing head, now only twenty feet distant. The gross flesh before him responded like a steel spring. With lightning-like rapidity, it caught the gun in midair, mouthed it in a moment, then dropped it. Henry shrieked the wild laughter of the victor in combat, the insane cry of the maniac. Look out, Ted! Alan's cry was sharp. Ted whirled to see Alan throw something at the rock to which the giant worm's body seemed to cling. A bitter, sharp report, a quiver in the flesh before them, a gurgling. Then, with a great gaping wound in its side, the worm writhed to seize his unfortunate master, grasping the man with its suckers, pulling at his body. The man called Henry screamed horribly. Three times, (coughs) the rocky walls echoing his terrible cries of anguish and despair. (coughs) As the monster crushed its victim, Alan and Ted turned their eyes from the horrible sight. The wounded Leviathan tore the body of the helpless man in two. Alan's arm drew back and hurled again. Again. Two more detonations. Two more gaping wounds where disintegration made gulfs in the vile flesh. The fathomless evil eyes filmed, glazed. The giant head slowly sank to the rocky floor. The suckers relaxed and what had once been a wretchedly ambitious man crashed limply down. The evil pinkish flesh quivered twice and was still. Moloch, wakened in the night, listened incredulously to the story Ted and Alan told. Dr. Hirsch was not released. But when the next day Ted and Alan guided Sheriff Sorensen and a party to the cave— and the Moloch men saw for themselves the gigantic dead worm lying beside the tragically torn body of the Easterner, they were convinced. Dr. Hirsch was heartsick and shaken when he too saw the horrible sight. I will give it up, he declared. Mine extract, give it up. 
the moss, the cat, those flies, I try careful to be, but it leak, and he steal Henry, and feed it to his worm. Often I have seen his worm dance when he play. It is a rare cousin to Megascolex coerulius, giant worm of Ceylon, which grow normally three feet long. He was silent after that, crushed by the deaths that, in all innocence, he had caused. Alan and Ted took him home with them. On the journey, he spoke only once. He asked Alan, How did you know? I didn't know, replied the young scientist, until I heard what you were doing. The cat, the moss, the flies were teasing to the imagination. We found Henry going through your papers, the progressive deaths from chickens to sheep to cattle to men, all bloodless deaths, spoke of something growing bigger, hungrier. Mathematics disposed of a giant bear or coyote. Weight increases as the cube of size, strength as the square. A giant bear would break his legs from his weight. The canyon disclosed many small stones, all with the narrow ends pointing one way. Shrubs were dragged out roots and all by a moving weight that went over them. Sagebrush clumps leaned right and left, as if something large and heavy had been pulled through. It was something so big that it snagged off skin and broke a feeler in crowding between jagged boulders six feet apart. And on various rocks, the dried alkali from slime was faintly visible. The only living organism that might grow to a huge size and not break of its own weight was a worm, a snake, something that supported most of its mass over a large surface. And the explosive? Ted asked humbly. He couldn't forgive himself for that slip in the matter of the gun. An adventurer of his experience taking a gun from an unfriendly hand and not examining it from A to Z. Just taking a long chance, answered Alan. I brought it to see what it would do on rocks in the canyon, but it proved to be the only weapon which could stop such a... such a... Horror, put in Ted. Such a horror in a few shots. The shattering and disintegrating forces together did the work. Why didn't you throw before? I was frightened out of my wits, declared Ted. I could see what might happen if that monster, wounded, went wild. Henry had it under control, but he persisted in making me choose between his chance to live and ours. Neither Ted nor Alan is given to nightmares. But now and then, one or the other hears in the night the echo of a despairing shriek and sees a giant worm rear a slimy neck on high and wakes to shudder at what might have happened if the slight, dark-skinned man with a lust for power had succeeded in stealing the secret of uncontrolled growth, the extract that creates monsters from the pit. The end. Die by my hand. Welcome back, everybody. I creep across the land. I hope you enjoyed the story, Killing Firstborn Man. Uh, you know, it's funny because when you were telling me we were going to do this episode, you sent it my way. You you put your uh, your finished version of the story into the Dropbox, and you said, "Yeah, the, uh, the the story's in the Dropbox. Check it out before we do the episode." And I looked at it. It said, "Creeping." D dot 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 W A V or whatever it was, I don't remember. But I saw that and I thought, oh, Rish has finally sent me his Metallica story. Because I don't know if anybody was listening, if anybody remembers this, but a little while back we did an episode where we talked about how we had pledged to write a story based on the title of a Metallica song. And it could be any Metallica song. We were free to choose whichever one we wanted. I picked Frayed Ends of Sanity. 
hear them calling me. And Rich Outfield chose not Creeping Death. I have no idea why I assumed Creeping Death was your Metallica story, because I knew that it wasn't. I knew that you had chosen My, my friend, friend of Misery. misery. So what was my problem? Hmm. Well, it just because it, Creeping Danger and Creeping Death are so close. Yeah. You can't be faulted for making that uh, assumption. That's, oh, hey, he said he would send me a story inspired by a Metallica song. And now he has. Yeah, I was all excited. But no, I will send you nothing. Yes. Dictionary.com, you teach me nothing. Okay, we will allow announcer man to say that. <laughs> Dictionary.com, you teach me nothing. There you go. Thank you. There you go. But yes, uh, the, the warning at the beginning of the, of the story, should we have warned people more on this? Or should, should I talk about how this story came to be? Sure. Yeah, I would start with that. Let's start with that. How did this okay. story come to be, Rish Outfield? So on the property of my childhood home, there are several sheds and such and and garages that my dad put up over the years and do those sheds and garages have names like interesting names i'm just like i'm just curious they have names but they are not interesting names names like the pink palace would that be a name of a shed the pink palace is the name of a shed good job my mom always hated it because it was a salmon color and uh, it sucks yeah, that, that's not an interesting name. You're right. But That's a regular name that someone would call their shed. Well, yeah, there's the bicycle shed, <laughs> and then there's the tin garage. And the tin garage is where all my dad's tools and fishing supplies and junk that he had collected over s more than 70 years, really, because at one point they emptied out his childhood home and abandoned it and... Uh, I guess he, he was a hoarder of some sort, and he's like, I want all the stuff from that house. And through basically the tin garage now, in 2018, has become a, a, a black widow spider hatchery. A breeding ground? <laughs> yes. They breed out of control in there. And I'm terrified by black widow spiders. I'm really afraid of them. That's weird. Why? There's tons of them in there <laughs> so, so from time to time we will go in there and and i i don't exaggerate when i say it's probably my least favorite place on the earth it's just dust and mildew and then yes spiders and more dust and many many years worth of of forgotten things and and as we were going through trying to find what what should be thrown out what should be kept what should be sold I found a box, and the box was of magazines, not from my dad's childhood, but from his uncle's childhood from the late 20s to the late 30s. Wow. And as I was going through the box, they're, they're in fairly good condition, all these magazines. I was just like, please let there be a, a comic book. Please <laughs> right. let there be one Superman comic one book, one Batman comic book. <laughs> one action comic. Please, that's all we want. And uh, no, there wasn't anything like that. But there was a stack of, let's say, 40 issues of American Boy magazine from the 20s through to uh, about 1940. And uh, I, I, I had never heard of American Boy magazine. It's just not, uh, it's been forgotten, kind of like Carl Cloudy. It wasn't Boy's Life. It was American Boy yeah, it's just, it's sort of gone away. Uh, but the first issue that I grabbed, I just like looked it over and I found the ads quaint. Like on the back of the magazine, it, there's an ad for Buck Rogers Fireworks. Ooh, nice. Uh, yeah, you can order all these things to blow your fingers off through American Boy magazine. <laughs> they can just send you bombs through the mail. Nice. But I assumed that American Boy magazine would be like Boy's Life, you know, it's like how to tie a, a, a hitch knot, you know, how to stop copious bleeding, <laughs> which toads are okay to lick, you know, that kind of stuff. Which are the best toads to lick? Actually, <laughs> it's all short stories that are uh, supposed to appeal to a boy in the 1930s. 
And the very first story is Creeping Danger by Carl Claudi. And it has this very striking illustration of a gigantic fly. And when I say gigantic, I'm going to say 40 foot fly attacking a man on horseback out in the desert. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I'm going to read this. This is really interesting. So it still appeals to American boys is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, so I got it and I, I started reading the story and I decided even before I'd finished the story, I'm going to read this and do it as an episode of my podcast, which is the Rish Outcast. And so I sat down and I recorded the whole thing and did all the voices myself. And I mentioned to the, uh, the listener of my podcast, I did this and it's kind of a shame that Big isn't participating. And, and the listener said, well, maybe you should do it as a Dune Steve episode. And that way, someone other than me will hear it. So yeah, I just, I asked if you were up for it and didn't wait for an answer. I just sent it to you and said, <laughs> okay, voice this main guy. Yeah, it was interesting because of the fact that it's from a magazine from 1937. You didn't have a digital copy of it. And I no longer live uh, in the same area as you. So you couldn't just bring it to Wendy's where we meet and then I could sit there and read it off of the magazine. So <laughs> what we had to do was you took photographs with your phone of all the pages I had to read and I just had to figure it out because you, you, your plan was to try and sell these magazines like on eBay or whatever. And so you were not interested in going through and highlighting my lines for me. So I just assumed when they said there was a big dude that that must be my character. And then when there was a, a guy that that big dude called Shrimp, that must be your character. <laughs> So I, I went with that, <laughs> hoping that I was reading the right lines. But uh, it was uh, a, a different way of going about it, for sure. Um, I think you had to send me a second text or I mean, you text me some extra pictures because I'd missed a couple of lines that I was supposed to have said and didn't. But for the most part, it worked out. Yeah, taking pictures of it wasn't the best way to go. I, I think if we were to do this again... I would just scan each page and I'm trying to think of a magazine that's this big today. But you've seen the Saturday Evening Post uh, back when it existed, right? That's how this magazine is. It's super oversized. It's like the old Life magazines back in like the 50s. Yes, just like the old Life magazine. Excellent. That's a better example. But I think it's still possible to scan those i'd just have to scan each page more than once i don't know i i thought the the photos were fine i was able to zoom in on them and read them just fine so it wasn't that oh, big of a good. deal it was just a little unusual anyhow uh as as i said i had recorded the whole thing myself and i tried to do different voices for all these characters which was kind of easy because they're all written with like different ethnicities <laughs> right. It was really strange. You know, there's like the German scientist and his dialogue is written in this, uh, I, I, I don't know, how do you say? Uh, you would have me tell you with a V. You cannot, with a D, keep a bottle on a shelf with Ds, yet you would have me tell you. Very much like uh, like Huck Finn or something. <laughs> yeah phonetically yeah phonetically that's good but once i had recorded it there's there's also uh the swedish sheriff and uh when i was editing the story together i realized that the german scientist and the swedish sheriff i had done uh, pretty much the same voice so i asked our good buddy uh, marshall latham to voice the sheriff so in a way it became Sort of a, a Dune Steef thing. Yeah, it became a full-on, full-cast production. And Marshall's Swedish accent was really spot-on, I thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he speaks like a native. <laughs> but anyhow, I, I mean, we, we had mentioned several months ago that the days of full-cast productions are probably behind us. A full, full-cast, where, you know, every character has a different voice. Right. Because it's just such a giant headache. 
And this episode would have come and gone a long, long time ago if it had just been me with my recording and all that. It's just, you know, with each additional person involved, it becomes harder and longer. Right. And the story does too. <laughs> <laughs> but we put this out, and, and, and as the <laughs> listener said, you know, now more people may hear it. And I would be interested to see if people enjoyed it. I mean, it's a long story. It's of its time. Yeah. And in some ways it's super dated. But in other ways, I was still a little bit surprised by like the level of violence in the story because it's ostensibly for kids. Right. You know, for, for boys. Well, these are the these are the same kids that can order explosives through the mail by <laughs> answering the ad on the back of the magazine. So they I'm guessing they were a little tougher than today's kids. They were probably using those explosives to hunt for their dinner. The, the other <laughs> thing that's, that's kind of striking about the story, and I don't know, the, the, we originally talked about it a lot before we ever put the episode up, out, is, you know, will people pitch a fit on about this in 2018? There are some aspects of the story that probably wouldn't be super acceptable in 2018, Sure. Okay, they, the very first page, they have Oki, the Japanese servitor. <laughs> right. You too much crowd in kitchen, Oki objected. I, I don't know that that's cool today. I mean, I, I hope people didn't get offended by that. I mean, if they did, then <laughs> you. <laughs> but if they didn't... If they took into consideration, oh, okay, this is nearly a hundred-year-old story now. Where, at 37, that makes it how old? 40? It makes it 81. 81 years old, okay. Yeah, this, this story, interestingly enough, was published two months before my dad was born. <laughs> wow. But, but yeah, we talked about this together, and I, I found it, I hate to say it, but I found some of this... Is it ethnic stuff? Whatever it is, I found it kind of amusing. That it's like every single character was a different ethnicity. Like it's a small town in the freaking middle of Wyoming. That seems like the kind of place where there wouldn't be a Swedish sheriff. <laughs> or a, a German, German scientist, scientist. Or an Indian assistant. Yeah. This is like the X-Men of sci-fi stories, you know, so apparently. It's almost as though he wrote this with audio in mind. It's like someday they'll do this as a radio show. Yeah, there. I mean, that was the thing of the time. So maybe that was what he was after. Is like, I'll write this story and then we'll be able to just turn it straight into a radio play for the... Fuller soap variety hour. That's right. It was always a soap or, a, yeah, that's, that's just... <laughs> beach nut gum variety hour. <laughs> Didn't you say there was an ad for beach nut gum in that uh, magazine? There, well, there are so many ads, but I wouldn't be surprised if... Yes, uh, beach nut gum. Apparently it was available in peppermint, spearmint, pepsin... <sighs> Hell Wait, is Pepsin? what is Pepsin? And what is Oral Gene? Oral Gene? The new firmer texture gum that aids mouth health and helps fight mouth acidity. Oh. <laughs> Oral Hygiene Gum. I bet four out of five dentists uh, recommend Oral Gene Gum. <laughs> yes, most popular flavor of gum in America is Beech Nut Peppermint. Try our spearmint, too, if you enjoy a distinctive flavor. And then, yeah, pepsin is gum in a crisp candy coating. Doubly delightful that way. Oh. Peppermint, spearmint, pepsin. That must be like chiclets, where it's like got the hard candy outside and then gum in the middle. Yeah, I don't know. That, that kind of stuff, I... I kind of long for that era now and then, you know what I mean? Like nowadays kids, they don't have to use their imagination for anything, you know? They just, they, they've got Netflix right there on their phone. They can watch anything. All movies are made with like a crap ton of CG that's basically indistinguishable from reality. 
I was watching something where they were talking. I, I want to say it was a thing about the Thundercats. Oh, no. Basically, they were talking about the advantages that they had being animated back in the day. An animation, a, a, a cartoon, anything you could imagine they could put on screen. You know what I mean? Because it was just, it was all just drawings anyways. And so they could do stuff that movies and, and so forth couldn't do because it was just too expensive and too hard. But yeah, those days are past. Now, every movie is that way. And they've taken those cartoons and remade them all as live action movies. Hell, Dumbo is about to come out in live action. We've had Beauty and the Beast and the darkest retelling ever of the Jungle Book, etc. And <laughs> the old days where, where somebody had a magazine... You would get it once a month and you would sit down or you'd read the comic books. Just that kind of a more sensory filled life. You talked with your friends about things. You didn't just text them. It's <laughs> It makes me think of that. There's that Weird Al song that came out. I want to say it was his album called Mandatory Fun, where he came out with like a whole bunch of music videos all at once. Like each day he came out with a new one. And one of them was called First World Problems. And the song was just a guy complaining about, oh, the hardships that he had to face. And yeah, one of them was somebody actually called him on the phone. Doesn't the guy know how to text? Ew, now he has to talk to him and interact. And I, I don't know, man. It, it makes me kind of sad that that stuff has gone away. Like, my kids spend most of their time just sitting in their rooms looking at their phones. They don't go and hang out with their friends. If they do anything with friends, they do it just over their phones. I remember, like, high school and college years and stuff like that as being special times, you know, when you really had lots of friends and you did lots of stuff and you experienced a lot of f neat first things, like your first love or whatever. And I, don't, I, I think my kids aren't getting that experience. I think it's just because the tactile, you know, I, you, you don't do that stuff anymore. You don't sit and read a magazine anymore. It's But... You know, neither of us, I, we're getting up there in age. I saw a picture of you the other day, and uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure the parents of, of my dad's uncle complained that, you know, he this kid had this magazine, and he went off and he read indoors, and he didn't get any sunshine, and he spent hours reading that magazine Oh, it's just destroying our youth. Yeah, he should have been out milking cows, damn it. But then you, and I always repeat your words of wisdom, say, why are all the books when we go into Target about a girl with girl in the title? And, you know, it's all about female protagonists by female authors. And why is that? It's because boys don't read. Well, yeah, but you didn't say it so vehemently like I always do. Oh, sorry. Because boys don't read. Oh, let me do it again. Sorry. Boys no, no. don't read. There, there, oh, there you go. Was you, that vehement? You actually did it better than I did. You do you better than I do. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> one more thing about this, though. We did talk about this, and we did worry about warning people about... Uh, what do they call that thing where you say, Oh, guys, this movie you're about to see... You know, a man slaps a woman in it, so we need you guys to know before you watch it. A trigger warning? Is that what you're trying to get there at? There you go. Oh, that's 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 what I was tiptoeing around. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. But, like, the, the villain character is this kid from India. Young man from India. His name is Henry, isn't it? Well, I suppose. And that really tricked me. As I, as I was narrating it, because, you know, I just did him as a, a normal American. And then <laughs> when we get to the revelation that he's, oh, my gosh, he's got a turban on. Then I was just like, oh, shoot, I might have to go back and revoice this whole thing. Oh, no. But ultimately, I decided, no, he's, he's trying to blend in and not draw attention to himself. So he speaks American until the point here when his disguise can drop and he says 
I hate you. I hate you all. I steal Dr. Hirsch's extract. Twice I steal it. It's... And then I did the, the accent and all that stuff. And I don't know if that was the right way to go. But it's just funny. It's like, see, see, cried the Easterner. The suckers, they clamp, they rend, they tear. It's... What is the word I'm looking for? The, the, it's just, it's no longer acceptable to do that. Oh, right. I guess politically correct. It's not politically correct to do that anymore. Uh-huh. And so I was a little bit worried that people might, I don't know, say, hey, that's not cool, man. <laughs> but the next story in this magazine is called Big Bogey Jones. Okay. And it's got phonetic... It's got, ain't no use, Mr. Johnny. Hit it be easier to wake up de dead, D-E, dead. Uh-huh. It's like Faulkner. And it... Sounds like a Faulkner novel. We get damn hogs of fattening. Again, that sort of thing is not smiled upon nowadays. You know, the same people that say, you know, Huckleberry Finn should be banned. Is it that... that page in our history book should be torn out and burned because it upsets people or because it asks quite it brings up questions that that people would rather not answer Mm -hmm. and so i yeah i was a little bit worried you know that are we should maybe we should tiptoe around this but i in the same way that you think oh wow that's kind of neat that people used to read pulp magazines and use their imagination they'd listen to the radio you know what I mean? It was yeah, good. and they wore straw hats and overalls too. That was okay. That wow. was really what I missed most was the straw hats and the overalls. Gross, dude. But I kind of <laughs> found that aspect of this story charming. I kind of find that period in our history charming, where um, maybe maybe it was insensitive, but it's just it's seen through the prism of the time in which it was put out. Uh, Huckleberry Finn, for example, that character that's so reviled today, I'm not sure that Mark Twain meant for that to be racist or hateful in any way. Right. That was a, a heroic character. That's a friend of the main character. That's He's a good guy. Uh-huh. And I, a lot of times I feel like you got to take the intention and then, uh, you know, the, the historical context with it for example, around 2000, 2005, Disney started putting out collections of their animated f- shorts. But there were a bunch that were problematic uh-huh. with, like, depictions of, of Hitler and Hirohito in them and, ooh, you know, stuff like that. We're just like, oh, gosh, and there's going to be some racial slurs. And, oh, no, this character is clearly meant to be, you know somebody from the south and 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 so what disney chose to do is to have leonard malton appear in at the in the house of every single person that bought this video he he was so tired by the end of this tour (laughs) no he recorded little vignettes before each cartoon telling people about the historical Right. Reasoning for this. And he's like, you know, the, what, what you're about to see, they use a word that we don't use anymore. And you have to understand that Americans were incensed by the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Disney made these cartoons at the behest of the U.S. government. Stuff like that. Where he tried to explain the reasoning as sort of a, you know, hey... You may find this objectionable, but here is why it is the way it is before you start screaming that it's objectionable. Anyway, I thought that that was fascinating, that uh, collection of short things. And I feel like some of this stuff, which is completely forgotten, Carl Cloudy or Claudie, we don't even know how to say his name, is forgotten, right? Right. Just it's been swept up by the sands of time. Yeah, unless you have a tin garage with a (laughs) big box full of old magazines, you'll never, ever hear this again. And I think it's important that that things just don't go away. You know what I mean? You can't progress if you just wipe away 
the less you know you you forget the past then you're going to wipe away the lessons that you learned from the past and maybe you need a little something to give you the historical significance to it because not everybody knows not everybody's going to understand that kind of stuff and maybe that's why some people get upset as they don't have the context that goes with it you know i mean it's like when we have to read a Shakespeare play these days, you know, you you get assigned Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or whatever in school. You get it in a textbook and it'll have all sorts of additional things in it to help you to understand it. Because, I mean, it's pretty difficult to understand without the context and without some help saying, oh, yeah, this phrase here means this. You know, yeah, it's a phrase that has completely gone away now. But back in the, in this time, it meant this and it came from this and you get all those kind of things. And, and then Shakespeare is, you know, one of the preeminent genius writers ever in the world because you understand it. Otherwise, you'll be like, oh, fuck this shit. I don't want to read it anymore. It's too... I mean, it's not quite as bad as like trying to read an untranslated copy of Beowulf, but almost, you know, it feels sometimes like that. Like, Jesus, one step short of being Anglo-Saxon instead of English. Well, there's that saying that English speakers are the only people who are not able to read Shakespeare in their native language. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it gets translated into modern language for all the people in other languages, uh, in other places. But with those who speak English, we still got the original stuff and we're expected to understand it. And uh, that can be really difficult if you don't have all the tools at hand. And I think that that's kind of the way it is with like those Disney cartoons or, you know, this story or just history in general. It's an important thing that people get the full context to be able to understand things and then i think you can deal with it you know what i mean and maybe what you're you decide is that man we were terrible people back then or we were shit or whatever but at the very least you understand what's going on and you can deal with it hopefully you don't try and judge people from the past based on the standards of today because they didn't have those standards they weren't taught those things they didn't know or weren't expected to be the way that we are. So you got to make some allowances for that kind of stuff because people are always a product of their times. But uh, yeah, you don't want to forget about the times either. You don't want to forget what it was like before because, yeah, there's the other saying of those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And there's plenty of things in history that it would be much better off that we didn't repeat. Okay. So so you uh, you don't think it was a, a huge mistake for me to insist that we do this? No, no. I, I, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. Uh, I have to admit that it took me a, uh, a little while to get all the way through the story. I don't know what the deal was. <laughs> I tried to listen to it, I think... On Monday, for some reason, I'm always falling asleep Monday afternoon. I don't know if I stay up too late Sunday night or what, but I'm always like falling asleep. And the first time I tried to listen to it, I think I tried to listen to it in my car. You killed three pedestrians? No, no. Actually, I was listening to it as I was going to bed the first time and I fell asleep during it. So I never made it to the end. So I'm like, oh, crap, I got to listen to it again. And I listened to it on a Monday <laughs> When I was totally falling asleep. And the funny thing is, like, like that deal, what was the, kid, the kid's name? Was Henry or whatever, the bad guy? I was completely confused because I drifted off, I think, for a minute or two there. And it was right at the point where he changed from being the, the boy who talks like this to the one who, who said, See the suckers! See them rend, <laughs> or whatever that quote was that you read. I hate you. Yeah, it was right in the middle of that spot, and I woke back up, and I'm just like, "What the hell's going on? I don't know. Uh, I guess there's a bad guy." <laughs> and so eventually, luckily, I, I I did get around to listening to it while awake, 
and uh, it made a little more sense. Hopefully, uh, other people weren't confused. I, I was forewarned at this point that that was going to happen, that there was going to be a change in that character, because I, I talked with you about it, and you mentioned that, and I thought, oh. So, hopefully, everybody else got it as well. It was an interesting way to do it. It wasn't transparent, specific in the story that, you know, he was faking and then he came out and, you know, revealed his true self. It's not like some spy, you know, that was passing themselves off and then all of a sudden now they have a German accent and you're like, oh, this spy was a Nazi all along. Get him, Captain America. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's an interesting choice to make and it, it hopefully people liked it and they... Uh, and they got it. But yeah, I, I thought it was a good story, and I, I thought it was definitely worth doing. But uh, yeah, the weird thing is, there's never a moment when a 30-foot fly attacks a guy on horseback. <laughs> that is true, yeah. They specifically come out and talk about how it has to be a certain kind of creature that could withstand the pressure, I guess, the gravity that would crush it if it were made much larger. And yeah, maybe that worm was was just a maggot that was going to become a fly. And the fly is actually from uh, the sequel. Ooh, by the way. <laughs> but, but speaking of sequels, um, apparently Cloudy wrote several stories about Ted Dolliver and Dr. Alan Kane's adventures oh. over the years. This was not the first one that American Boy published. They, they did several... Uh, and I looked through a couple other magazines and found another story in this series. And I thought, oh, okay, well, if people like it, maybe we'll do another one. He did collect these stories in a book. I know there's a word for when they would collect short stories in a book, but like sort of write little little bookend things connecting them all so that it becomes a novel yeah uh, and it was called the blue grotto terror and it was published in 1939 huh but it's long long out of print and so um yeah maybe the only way to find the rest of these ted dolliver stories is to go through those magazines of my uh, <laughs> my great uncles or my dad's or or mine now <laughs> go through that box to brave the black widows uh, yeah, I, I got them all out of the, the box, all of the American boys, at least, and put them in a big bag. And uh, Yeah, I've heard about what, that you've done that with a lot of American boys, but... Uh... Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I think Big is right. Who is? Check, please. Oh, jeez. Back on topic, guys. Uh, yeah, just uh, if, if the listeners will uh, let us know what they thought, does a story like this hold appeal to a modern audience and uh, if they would like to hear more. Like our buddy Marshall Latham, he used to have a whole podcast where he would produce, or not produce, but he would re-present, is that what you'd call it? Old like radio shows and things uh -huh. like that. Yeah. Palm Olive Soap Presents. <laughs> That's right. And now, a word from our sponsor. Palm Olive and Beechnut <laughs> Gum present Blue Grotto Terror. But first, a word from our sponsor, That's Buck right. Rogers Fireworks. Kids, do you have all your fingers? Well, that can't do. Let's see if we can remedy that. <laughs> you must be a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyhow, yeah, it's a shame that you and I live so far apart because maybe we could have just, you know, read this story together all cuddled up under a blanket. Oh, yeah. But the, the, the magazine itself is very, very quaint. You know, lots of uh, celebrity endorsements on these ads. And yeah, I, I have no idea who any of these <laughs> celebrities are. But uh, yeah, the very last page of the magazine, there is a... A page of jokes, like they would do in... I'm sure Boy's Life did it. If Boy's Life still exists, they do it. Reader's Digest always had jokes. And I thought uh, it would be fun to read a joke and see what passed as humor in 1937. All right, yeah, that sounds like a good way to, to wrap up the show. Let's have a joke. 
Okay. Maybe we'll we'll get announcer man's opinion uh, of the joke afterwards. Screw you guys. Choose your own one-time donation amount. <laughs> uh, okay, the doctor was interviewing the last patient in his office when a woman rushed in crying, Doctor, doctor, come quickly. My husband has swallowed a mouse. Get back to him, said the doctor, and try waving a piece of cheese about in front of his mouth. I'll follow. Five minutes later, the doctor reached the house. The man was lying on a settee with his mouth wide open, while a hysterical woman was waving a kippered herring close to his mouth. You foolish woman, he cried. I told you cheese. I know that, she shrilled. But now I've got to get the cat out. The, the cat. It, I, there was a cat. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. Why? I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. But we're going to wave a piece of poop in front of her mouth and maybe it'll come out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that it's not a terrible joke. It's not. It's a little wordy for this, but it, it's it's about Laffy Taffy level of humor. Oh, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> there has never been a decent Laffy Taffy joke in history. All right. You really liked this one? or? Well, I read it fudging twice. Yeah? I read the punchline eight times because <laughs> I couldn't get it right. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that lovely joke. What did you think, announcer man? Wow. Today's show sucks more than one of Rish Outfield's pickup lines. Yeah. I didn't hear him say anything. <laughs> that's because he's not real oh! alright thanks for listening everybody to the show I'm Big Anklevich I'm Rich Outfield and I'll see you again next time goodbye the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial no derivatives license Meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. I love that Josh Groban, personally. Take two. I kind of long for that era now and then, you know what I mean? Like, these days, our kids, I don't know, they don't use their imagination. Like, every kid just has a phone in their hand, and they just bring up Netflix or whatever, or... Oh, no. Oh, shit. Hold on a sec. Fire alarm is going off upstairs. It'll probably go off again, though. Okay, let me see if I can start that over, if I can remember what I was saying. You said nowadays kids just turn on their phones and, and rape.